How's it going everyone? My name is Keenan and welcome to my channel and today we're going to be talking about some problems. Construction problems. Like any job out there, the road is not always going to be so rosy. So for anyone out there just starting their career in construction or just wanting to know what to look out for, today I'm going to be talking about the five common problems that I see in construction and how you can help avoid some of these mistakes and the lessons that I've learned over my career thus far. So you can be a better engineer or manager of construction. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any more videos like this. I make videos every Monday and Wednesday on construction, engineering, and some personal finance stuff. Basically all the stuff that didn't teach you in school and how to better position yourself for your future. And with that, let's get into our problems. So number one. Communication. Communication is so key in construction. You've got a big team, you've got multiple people that you need to communicate with, and yet it's always a problem on every job. So from a verbal communication standpoint, a lot of times people that have been doing construction for a long time, the lingo that they use may not necessarily be the same lingo that you know we are accustomed to growing up. If you haven't been in the industry for a long time, there's a lot of terms and things like that that you don't normally use. Example, so I was out there in the field with my superintendent one time, and we were trying to measure something and he told me to hold a foot. So what did I do? And was I correct? Was he really trying to challenge my dexterity and see if I could balance on one foot? Nope. This is holding a foot. So you see how at the end here you don't really see the end of the tape measure? Here is where you hold the foot so that you make sure that you're exactly on that one line and you take your measurement from there. You usually do this if you're trying to take really precise measurements. So if you didn't know as well, you really need to extend this piece out on your tape measure to get a true measurement. If you have it sucked in like this, you're actually off by a little bit. But there's not only that, there's a lot of times when there's a lot of different lines in construction. You tell someone to use one elevation line, but they will use a different one just because someone used a different color chalk. And a lot of times these problems can be solved if you just insert yourself, don't be lazy and walk outside and actually do things with the workers. Verbal communication can be a challenge from a office to field standpoint, within your own office, and even just amongst the field guys. A lot of times too, there could be language barriers that are in the way between you and the workers as well. So you as an engineer just starting out, make sure that you do what you can to not only communicate well, but also let someone else know if you don't properly understand the situation. Don't assume anything in construction. Make sure you fully understand it to the point that you could build or do the thing yourself. And it also goes with drawings as well. So I've seen a lot of times some people get a little lazy and they just give some of the workers these like messy drawings that have all these different markups on it. Consolidate your work. Give your workers a clean drawing that's very easy to use. Not that they can't do it, and not that they're not smart enough to do it, but the more efficient that you can help your hourly workforce be, the better it is for your company. So give them only the information that they need on the drawing, make sure the drawing is very clear, you can see all the dimensions on the drawing, it's not in like size two fonts that you need a magnifying glass to see it. And just make sure that you give them a great product, at the end of the day you want them to be efficient. Efficiency in the field makes money for the company, and that's really your job as an engineer in construction. And then finally, and this is my biggest pet peeve, talk to people don't just email. I cannot stand when somebody sends me an email and they're sitting like two cubicles down from me. It's like, just use your mouth. I don't think I'm that aggressive. But other things too, if you're having a tough conversation with someone or you know, someone did something wrong, always call someone first. Have a conversation with them that helps build the relationship instead of just sending an email. It's, it's, it seems almost cowardly to just hide behind the technology of a letter rather than just having a conversation with the person, it calms their emotions down so that they don't make an emotional firing back answer to you. So again, think about how you would want someone to communicate with you. Always know that the relationship at the end of the day is one of the most important things to maintain and just be the best communicator that you can be and encourage others to do the same. So problem number two, transitions. Transitions in construction always cause problems. Whether you're transitioning between different materials, different trades, these fine details where you have multiple things coming together always create issues. So I'm going to show you some examples. So, to the board. Welcome to the board. So say you have your concrete slab here and you have two different materials coming into each other. You'll have a maybe some tile, which maybe the tile is about 3 8 thick with 3 16 th thin set on the underneath it. And maybe you have some sort of thin flooring like LVT or luxury vinyl tile. And you have these materials butting up next to each other. 
So you want to know how thick is this material and how is that transitioning to this material. A lot of times LVT will be a lot thinner than the tile. So you have to figure out how are these two materials going to talk to each other. Sometimes you may even have a different installer doing this, the LVT, versus the tile. So you have to figure out who's owning the transition. So sometimes the LVT guy will have like a little end cap here that will cap his flooring butting into the tile. Or, or the tile guy will have their own little, what they call a schluter strip. Schluter strip, word of the day. That ends their tile and transitions into the floor. This can get even more important when you start looking at your doors. So here you can see the difference in what is the LVT of this floor and the carpet. So you see how there's a big difference in thickness. So say if you're down here, you see here, here's your door. So imagine if your carpet was on this side, your door would probably swing into your carpet and it would be a, and it would be tough to open. So that's the kind of stuff that transitions can mess with you with. So here you can see how these two materials transition nicely to each other because they're roughly the same thickness. But these are the kinds of things that matter, especially if you're selecting materials for your own home. So this is my favorite one that I like to talk about. So you see how you have two different thicknesses of flooring. And this is that transition of the base, right, that we're talking about. Transition, so this is what they decided on. I'm sure there were many meetings about this, um, but transition. If you don't spend the time up front to go through these details and go through this process, it's gonna end up wasting you money and time, and that's really what ends up killing the job at the end of the day. And now I'll transition to number three, construction tolerances. So materials and different ways of install have different tolerances per spec in construction. It's important that you know what each tolerance is for everything that you're installing and you have to make sure that you correlate that to the details in the drawings. So like here's an example. In a theoretical world, if you have a regular typical wall with a 3 and 5 8 inch stud with two layers of 5 8 inch drywall on each side, what should your wall thickness be? If you guessed four and a half inches, you're wrong. It's four and seven eighths of an inch, theoretically. However, so when you put those two layers of drywall on, and when you have your track and your stud in your track, it actually causes the board to come out a little bit at the bottom. At the end of the day, in every situation, your wall ends up being five inches. So when you order your door jams, your door jams that swallow the wall, you need to make sure that this door jam is ordered at five inches to account for the construction tolerances. All right, so this is a great example here. You have a two and a half inch stud, five eighths jip board on each side. So in theory, this should be three and three quarters inches thick. And here we have, behold, three and seven eighths. So that's your extra construction tolerances from your buildup of your drywall mud, your paint, everything on it ends up being ends up being one eighth bigger than your theoretical dimension. Construction tolerances. So also flush details. A lot of times when you go into high end, the designer always wants everything to be flush. However, you really need to communicate and make sure that you are not screwing yourself over and buying yourself into a detail that you cannot achieve in the field. So here's what I'm talking about. You don't really want flush details, right? Because if this was flush, you would see any imperfection between the end of this panel and the edge of the countertop because I can almost guarantee you that if I measure from the cabinet to the edge of the countertop, it won't be the same. So here we go here. So that's actually roughly, roughly seven eighths. And here, yeah, see, this is about an inch. So imagine if this was flush with this end panel over here, you would see you would see the panel either proud or inside of this and it wouldn't look as nice. Whereas now, since you have this edge over here, you can't really tell. You can't really tell the difference. When you create the flush details, you bring to light the imperfections that are just built into the tolerances and construction. If you're doing a commercial building where it's meant to be cyclical and you're supposed to be moving in a production fashion, you can't be spending the time and your sub trays don't want to be spending the time like really fine tuning every little thing 
One, because if you bid the job that way, you would never get that job. And then two, as a result of that, your sub trades are going to lose money. And they're going to fight you as a general contractor for that as well. So you want to make sure you can work with a designer and establish an understanding up front about what your expectation is for construction tolerances and how that works with their design. It makes you seem kind of lame as the contractor if you don't look forward for your construction tolerances ahead of time and just raise the red flag while you're there doing it. The perception of that looks like, ah, oh, you guys just think it's too hard and that's why you don't want to do it. It. The more you can set owner expectations, the happier they will be at the end of the project and the less surprises they will have and that leads to repeat work. So number four is the loss of materials and procurement of materials. So we'll start with loss of materials. On site, things tend to walk away. I'll give you an example. There was a time we were waiting for this one glass door. One glass door we were waiting months for. We unload it, but we also ended up unloading it in the area where we told our laborers to clean up. So this piece of glass that we were waiting months for was unloaded, and then our other laborer came around from the other side, not knowing about this glass, saw it in his area he was told to clean, picked it up with the forklift and threw it in the dumpster. There were not a lot of happy people that day. But it's just things like that. If you're on a hectic job site, stuff like that happens. It's not intentional, but you just have to be aware that this could exist. And then going from loss of material to procuring of material. You want to always make sure that you understand how long your materials are going to take to get to site. Track that against your schedule and then work backwards to see when you have to get all of your paperwork done to order your materials. It seems simple, but it's a problem on almost every job. If you don't have materials on time, your work in the field gets out of sequence, you end up having to go back and do certain things as materials arrive, and it just kind of ruins the flow of the job. So every job will likely have some sort of procurement log, which is tied to your schedule. So just make sure that it's updated. And another thing I would say is to dive deeper into where all your material is coming from. Like right now with the illness, anything that is coming from China may take a little bit longer. You also find out that during Chinese New Year, everything shuts down which will affect how long your material is going to take. So it's those kinds of things you need to be aware of and it's kind of interesting to follow the logistics of your material. And finally number five, it seems that it's becoming more of a trend in the industry that there are a lot more design changes and uncoordinated drawings from the beginning. And this may sound like a knock on the designer but it's not really that. So to preface this, as a general contractor, you have to expect a certain amount of change on the job. Everything's not gonna be perfect from the beginning, so you have to understand that things are going to evolve over time. Coordination as well. It is our job as a general contractor to coordinate amongst our trades. For example, if you have your pipes that are underneath our drywall ceilings, we have to make sure that we drop the ceilings or figure out ways to reroute our piping to make sure that we are buried. But from what I understand in the industry, it's slightly been getting worse and the contractor is taking on more responsibility of that coordination and change process. Where we're trying to build things in the field and things are changing at the same time. So there's a couple of ways that I think that this can be handled to help alleviate some of the stress. Because keep in mind, it's really hard to push a job forward when you keep trying to manage changes and coordination. If you're managing changes and coordination, you're constantly looking backwards. Because for your change to actually become part of your contract, it needs to get priced, it needs to get approved, and that process can take months. And then it finally gets into your contract. So if you do any of that work immediately when you get the change, you're actually more times than not at risk as the contractor. And this has happened on some of my jobs. We have moved forward with changes, assuming that we were going to get paid, and we did not. Because the owner said, well, if I knew what the price was going to be at the beginning, I wouldn't have told you to make that change. Because you can't load your job with people to manage changes, because then you'd never get the job, maybe there's something that can be put into the contract and defining what is considered reasonable change. Maybe it's a dollar amount, maybe it's the amount of changes, or maybe it just has to do with tracking time and things like that. What I've also been seeing done in the industry is that the contractor is being brought on in the design phase much earlier on so that you can have some of these constructability questions answered and vetted through before the project actually gets started. And what I think really helps as well as a contractor is you wanna have a good relationship with your design and ownership team. Like once you understand their story and you show that you actually care about what helps them out from your end, the better your relationship will be. And for me, that's the best way to conduct business in construction. Especially as a young engineer starting out, you want to create a good reputation for yourself in the industry. So you wanna be seen as somebody that's trying to help, that's trying to understand people's situation, instead of just trying to burden them with your problems. So those are five common problems that I see in construction. Quite honestly, there's a lot more and I can get like a lot more specific in the details. If you have any more questions about this, I'd love to answer them in your comments below. And also let me know if you enjoyed this video, if you want me to make like a part two to this.
which I probably will because, you know, we got a lot of problems. But if you learned something and you enjoyed yourself, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell below so you can join our growing family here on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate all the support and I'll see you on the next video.